at these uh, parables of Jesus and seeing what uh, truth they have to tell us. And so we're going to continue that today. We've, we're doing a series called Cultivate, but today we also start our focus on our stewardship focus for the year, for this next year, and we'll talk more about that. That's leading up to um, Commitment Sunday when we'll make our pledge for the ministry of Christ for the next year. Um, one of the fun things that, you know, get to do uh, as a pastor is go to parties. Um, Scott and Kaylee were out of town. That's our son and daughter-in-law. So Friday and Saturday we went to Tulsa and watched grandkids. And then some old friends of ours in one of our early churches up in Pahuska, their youngest son got married and... Uh, and so they did this deal where they did the wedding, the, the wife, the new bride was from Dallas. So they just invited the immediate family and had a small wedding in Dallas. And then last night in Pahuska, they had a party. They had a wedding reception. So Beverly and I went and uh, they wanted me to pray and say some things. And so uh, we had a great celebration. And the party was held at the Pahuska Country Club which was a lot smaller than we had remembered it when we used to live there. But we had a great time. We had a great, uh, it was a great party. We drove up and, uh, you know, they, uh, the Reed family, they run a fairly significant ranch up in Osage County. And we pull up and there's a sign that says, we celebrate Spencer and Alyssa's wedding. And the sign was on a saddle and the saddle was on a longhorn steer. And you could ride this steer. And uh, at the bottom of the sign, it said, and that's no bull. Because uh, it wasn't. It was a steer. Anyway, no pun intended there. But we, we had a great time. We got home uh, kind of late. Uh, and parties are fun. We got invited the other day to the Growing in Grace Sunday School class party. And uh, that was at Mick and Peggy Thompson's house. And uh, they did a great job. We had a great time. Uh, great food at that party. You know, if you want to do something special, invite the staff, the pastors, to your party. That was still weak. <laughs> uh, did you notice that, Jay, how weak that was? Uh, one of the things I do every year is uh, I do this kind of adventure. I call it the men's adventure. A few of us go to Colorado and we do a little hunting. And I remember the first time we went, there was a group from Texas that were there and this was kind of out in the wilderness and it's hunting camp and they were smoking cigars and drinking booze and you know and so there I mean it was a big deal and they were going around and introducing themselves my name's Larry I'm you know Dennis down in LaGrange Texas one guy from Houston anyway and we were going around and when he got to me I said I'm Adrian Cole I'm the pastor of New Covenant Methodist Church in Edmond I mean it just went dead <laughs> I mean it was like all of the blood ran from their faces and their heads and they looked at one another and said, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's a preacher here. I asked the outfitter that we go with, I said, have you had other preachers? He said, no, I think you're the first. <laughs> I've got a friend that travels, and he's a pastor, and somebody, you know, they'll usually ask, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I work for a global company working for cultural and economic transformation without telling him he's a pastor because he knows this effect that preachers have. You know, if you want to kill a party, go in and start talking about Jesus at a cocktail party. You know, it kind of squelches things. Uh, and so usually when he tells them he works for a global company working for cultural and, and e economic transformation, they'll get, oh, wow, tell us more about it. And then when he says, well, actually, I'm a pastor, then it goes dead. I think one of the reasons that that happens is because of people's view of Christianity. You know, people have these views that sometimes Christianity and some churches are judgmental and condemning and rigid and unwilling to change. And there are some churches unwilling to change. I've pastored some of them. New Covenant has been like that from time to time. Um, or if it's not that, then they think that Christian faith, the Christian faith is boring. And I'm just going to tell you that when Jesus invited people to follow him, it was not boring. It was exhilarating. And when you read the New Testament, 
And if you're paying attention, particularly, I like to focus on that passage in John we call the farewell discourse. And about John 13, 12, 13 to 17. And, and I would challenge you to go read that and just underline the number of times that Jesus uses this little three-letter word, joy. Is that what Christ came to do was to give us joy a life of joy and I'm telling you that those followers during the time of Jesus when he was crucified were feeling pretty persecuted they were feeling anything but joy and here he's about to face the cross and what's Jesus talking about joy he also in in chapter 10 talks about the abundant life and assurance of faith And what he promises us when we choose to follow is that he will never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. And this, I think, being a Christ follower, is the ultimate adventure in Christ. And we get to participate in this sort of unexplainable mystery of the presence of God. I think that's what the Christian life is about. And I think what Jesus brings is a little different image than sometimes what we come to. I think what Jesus brings is an understanding that the Christian life is a party. And that may be a little off-putting for some of you because you've never thought of the Christian life that way. But when you look at the Gospels and you read the story, where did Jesus spend most of his time? When he called Zacchaeus down out of the tree because Zacchaeus was curious when Jesus was walking by and he says, Zacchaeus, I want to go where? I want to go to your house. They had a party. When he gets Matthew, the tax collector, where does Jesus go? He goes with Matthew to Matthew's house and they have a party. One of the things that Jesus is criticized for is he's partying too much. Do you remember when he started his ministry? Jesus was in Cana of Galilee, up at the top of the country. Where was Jesus when he started his public ministry? He was at a wedding party. And to top it off, the wedding party, they run out of wine. And Jesus' mother says, we've got a problem. You need to take care of this. And Jesus takes water, and he makes wine from water. That is a weird passage of Scripture to try to explain to a conservative Sunday school class. People want to say, well, it was Welch's grape juice. It wasn't fermented. There wasn't any alcohol to it. I'm going to tell you that Jesus was the original party animal. We have this wrong image of the Christian faith. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Jesus, when he teaches, and we need to relax a little bit in our Christian walk, Jesus, he talked about, in this Christian life, he talked about a lost son, a lost coin, and a lost sheep. And after he talked about those things that were lost, he says, hey, we need to rejoice together. We need to celebrate because that which was lost has been found. Now, we have different understandings maybe today about party than Jesus had And sometimes because of those different images, it may be hard for us to understand this party image of the Christian life. And so we want to change that a little bit because what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about party, I think, is he's talking about being filled with joy. Being filled with joy. I learned that from my family. My papa, Blaise, had the most contagious laugh of any person that I, that I know, that I've known. When he laughed, he was a depression guy, and he was conservative and cautious, but he was full of life, and he filled the room. When he laughed, he'd throw his head back, and his teeth would show, and he would smile, and his laugh filled the whole room. When Bev's dad was in the nursing home, he was 95, It was his 95th birthday. We went to Minnesota. His birthday was in January. They had a community room. We got crepe paper and helium balloons and a cake. We invited neighbors and friends and residents of of Bev's dad. 
and his mind was keen had a little bit of trouble walking sometimes but his mind was and we had a party and he had a great time one of the privileges that we've had is to be a part of the walk to Emmaus walk to Emmaus is based on this image of Luke 24 about these two from Jerusalem walking to the city called this town called Emmaus and Jesus comes walks beside he comes and walks beside them and as they're walking along they don't recognize him they get to their house and they invite him in and he takes the bread and he breaks it and he he does communion with them and when they take communion the scripture says in Luke 24 their eyes are open on these weekends we just cover the basics of the Christian faith in 15 talks and you sit around tables and you just talk about what that talk means prevenient grace justifying grace life and piety priorities on and on it goes and you talk and somewhere along the weekend these men and women that go on these walks to Emmaus they see Jesus in a new way and their eyes are opened in a new life and I want to tell you when their eyes are open there is a party that happens when we went to Hong Kong for the first time to help them with the walk to Emmaus on Saturday night the, all the people that attend, the pilgrims, go, you know, and they gather. And in Hong Kong, the community dresses up in costumes. And they have, you know, those little, you know, little kazoos and all kinds of things. And they come marching into that room uh, to the song when the saints go marching in. And it is a party tonight, this evening. 1,500 to 2,000 people are going to gather out here. They're going to play games, and they're going to eat popcorn and hot dogs, and we're going to have a party out here, and the focus of this party is maybe one. Maybe one kid will come back. Maybe one mom and dad will come. Maybe because we shook somebody's hand, we said hello, maybe somebody at some point, their eyes will be open, and they'll see Jesus. The Christian life is a great adventure we've been looking at these parables and the truth is in this parable in Matthew 22 is that you're invited when we look at these parables and we reflect on these scriptures we ask these questions that help guide us in our understanding but more than that in the way we choose to live and here's the question this morning I want you to think about what is it that Jesus wants us to know about the kingdom of heaven we said from the very beginning that these parables were given so that we would understand what Jesus meant about the kingdom of heaven you may not have thought about the kingdom of heaven Jesus is trying to help us in our understanding of what that means. And so here is, a de here is one definition. And there's places in your bulletin for you to write notes if you want to capture any of this. There's also podcasts. Uh, you can go back and listen to it. But here's one definition. I think Dallas Willard has done a lot to help us understand uh, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he wrote several books. One of them, Divine Conspiracy. And some of you all read that. But the kingdom of heaven is anywhere or in any person where God is in charge. The kingdom of heaven is anywhere or in any person where God is in charge. Does that make sense to you? Hello? When we say, when we say yes to Jesus, when I say, God, I want you to be in charge of my life, I know I need you, I surrender myself to you, I invite you to take charge of my life, I want you to lead and direct my steps, my life. I think at that moment, we begin to, we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Interchangeably in the Gospels, there's this phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God and those things are used interchangeably 
54 times in the Gospels, Jesus uses this command, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, in that moment we say yes, God and Christ breaks through to us in that moment into our lives. And what we, what's important to understand is he breaks through because he's given us an invitation. So here's the first point. God offers or issues to us an outlandish invitation for everyone. Got it? God offers or issues an outlandish invitation to everyone. By everyone, what do I mean by that? Just white people? No. Everyone means everyone, right? White, black, brown, yellow, uh, white hair, black hair, brown hair, no hair, uh, big, little, small, old, young. The invitation is outlandish, and he offers this invitation to everyone. I work with uh, couples getting married, working with a couple now, and we do this thing called Prepare and Rich, and it's a course we go through. And one of the things that we talk about in the process, in this, in this pre-marriage counseling process, is stress. How stress affects us personally, how it affects us in our relationship. And one of the stressors we talk about specifically is wedding preparation stress. Okay? And one of the most intense, one of the most intense moments in wedding preparation regarding that stress is who is going to be on the invitation list. This couple we went to their party last night, they had their wedding and we've been a friend with that family for years and we weren't invited. Only the immediate families of both parties were invited to the wedding, but we were invited to the what? Party. I remember when our girls were going through that preparation and thank God for some friends that helped us. Um, we had a budget and we started looking at the list, the girls did, and they'd go back through that list. Well, we got to cut, we got to eliminate, we got to, and God bless Stephanie, um, they were supposed to go to Belize and uh, the Homeland Security told Paul, that if he leaves the country, he might not get in. So we ended up having the wedding here at New Covenant, and all of you, some of you got to go to their party. I don't think they appreciated that as much uh, as we appreciated you being here, but their hearts were broken because uh, well, they were going to Belize to get married. So we had the wedding on Friday, and then all of us went to Belize and left them here. We had a party. party. You remember the royal wedding that happened? not too long ago. You know how much that royal wedding cost? The invitation list was, there were 1,900 people on that invitation list. The royal wedding was $64 million. You know how much one piece of cake cost? $133 a slice. In Matthew 14, in 22, verse 14, here's what I'm telling you is when Jesus gives the invitation, it's to everybody. It says in verse 14, for many were called. And over and over again in these parables, we've had the parable of the soils, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the vineyard owner, today the parable of the banquet. And in each one of these parables, over and over again, God continues to offer an invitation for us to come. And what I want to tell you is in these stories of God's invitation of always offering, offering people to come, inviting people to come, that's an expression of the grace of God. 
Grace is unmerited favor. None of us deserve to be, to be there, to go to the party. None of us in our own lives, in our own ways of living, deserve this relationship that's being offered. But that's the grace of God. And when we're invited to a party, what's the, the first thing we accept? What's the second thing we think of when we're invited to a party? What are you going to wear? Huh? It would be embarrassing for me to say that we had to go to uh, a store yesterday and do a little shopping before we could go to the party last night. Uh, so I won't say anything about that. But, you know, one of the things that we have to uh, do is be careful because we could get in trouble. Uh, but one of the things that we have to think about is what we're going to wear, right? What am I going to wear? And I'm sure you've thought about that. In the text, Jesus says this, when the invitation is given, don't worry about what you're going to wear. When the king provided the invitation, there is some thought that he also provided the clothing. Augustine in the fourth century said when the invitation was given, he was pretty sure that the king offered the correct attire. And so everybody shows up at the party properly dressed, except for this one guy, and we're going to talk to him about him in a minute. But the good news is, is that the clothing God wants us to wear, the good news of the gospel, is God wants us to be clothed with his righteousness. That's the clothes of a Christian life, isn't it? Clothed with his righteousness. And so when you think about this story, God is offering his invitation to all of us because he wants us all to be in the kingdom of God. And he wants us to be clothed with his righteousness. Here's point number two. So he offers first this outlandish invitation. And secondly, God gives me a choice of how I can respond. Now when you read the story and the invitation is given... It says some just flat out reject it, some ignore it, some hear it, go back to work, some get violent and take the messengers and try to subdue them or beat them up, and some messengers are killed. But what does the king do in the story? What does God do, the image in the story? God continues, regardless of the response, God continues to send out messengers to the far reaches of his kingdom. But there's this one guy, and if you were listening to the story as Kendall read it, it's kind of disturbing, wasn't it? It says this one guy got the invitation, evidently he got the proper attire, but he was dressed improperly. And the king came in, and he saw, and everybody was, you know, given the appropriate attire and given the invitation, and... The king comes in and he sees everyone and he notices this one guy who's not dressed correctly and he approaches this guy and confronts him. And you know the word that he uses here? In some translations, it starts, the phrase starts with the word and the one we, that was read to us or that we read when we followed along with Kendall, it ended with the phrase, the king looked at the guy and said, friend. He referred to him in sort of in a filial relationship, that they had this connection. He called him friend. This guy, if you get the picture, accepts the invitation, but he comes wearing his old clothes. When, this is a few years ago, but I remember when I was going to the prom and... Uh, Mom and Dad offered to buy me a new suit. We wore suits to the prom in my day. And uh, we went to the Dixie store, was the name of the, of the men's store there. And, uh, and they bought me a new suit, and I had this shirt, and I had these gaudy cufflinks, the great big cufflinks. And, and uh, you know, I got dressed in this suit, and when I looked in the mirror, I thought, I'm somebody. I mean, I had this 
you know, this uh, tie clasp and had big amber, it's probably glass or something, but I mean, I looked at that and I thought, you know, I'm somebody. And, and the thought I had when I was reading this is what if I would have gone to the prom and not worn the clothes that mom and dad had sacrificed for me to wear? In the story, it says there was gnashing, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think in my experience, it wouldn't have been my dad and mom gnashing their teeth and weeping. It would have been me. This guy accepts the invitation and he wears his old clothes. I think what happens is he came to the party and instead of entering in, he stands by the punch bowl. Just standing there. He's taking advantage of the relationship he has with the king. He has a friendship with the king, but he's not properly dressed. Are you catching this picture so far? I'm about to close this out here. I want you to grasp this. Are you getting this? Now, why would Jesus talk to us about this? What's he trying to say to us? What's he trying to tell us? I think he's trying to say this, that when the invitation is given to become a follower of Jesus, we have to go all the way in. As you can't accept the invitation because you're taking advantage of the grace of God and then stand back in your old clothes and live the way you always lived when you weren't a Christ follower. Act the same way you always acted. Is God wants us to, to give our lives to come all the way in. In 1 Peter 5, 5, Peter says we need to clothe ourselves with humility and compassion and love and forgiveness for one another. There's a way we live together in community where we accept one another. We, lo- we live in this life of grace. In Romans 13, 14, Paul says we need to clothe ourselves with Jesus. We need to put on Jesus Christ. When we hear the invitation, we can't just go half-heartedly standing by the punch bowl. We come into this relationship as sinners. We've sinned against God. We can't leave as sinners. Then we haven't really accepted the invitation we haven't put on a new wardrobe that God provides for us we come in as sinners but God wants us to leave as saints the scripture says many are called but few are chosen so who's chosen who's in or out it's kind of a tough scripture when it talks about this guy who's improperly who was in who was out Here's the deal. We get to choose how we respond to the invitation. We get to make the choice. Those who are unworthy, as it's called in the parable, are those who are simply, now hear me, those who are simply unwilling. Lord, I want to give you my life, but I want to dictate the terms of the way that I choose to live in this life. When we keep wearing our old clothes, we keep standing off from God. We're unwilling, maybe, to let God transform us into the image of Christ. When we gather, we're still grumpy, maybe. When we gather on Sunday and worship, this ought to be a party. When the children gather in children's ministry, Christina leads them in Sunday school and children's church, there's a party. Our lives are to be full of joy. Because let me tell you what Jesus did, and then we're going to close. You've heard this before. Jesus lived the life that all of us are supposed to live. 
and he died the death that we should have died. But he took our place on the cross so that we could have the freedom and the grace and the joy, the joy of going all the way in and being a follower of Jesus. Where are you? We're in the stewardship launch. We're looking at what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Maybe your prayer could be, Lord, I accept your invitation and I offer myself to you completely. You respond as the Holy Spirit leads you this morning. And I want to